something to say. I hope you will enjoy it. Imagine that we're at graduation in front of a thousand people or however many would be there. Um, and the topic of my speech is expectations. I think personally, I think rather than being cute or whatever, I'd like, I think that a graduation speaker should bring something that is one more lesson. So uh, I am really looking forward to talking to you right now because it will enhance your educational experience. Some of you know that. I didn't do that a lot in AP. But um, this one's about expectations, okay? And I made sure to bring my banjo. I've been waiting to bring my banjo in for four years now, okay? So expectations, up to this point in your lives, whether you realize it or not, the, the person carrying the ball on expectations for you mostly was somebody else. Your parents expected things from you, expected good things or great things from you. And whether you knew it or not, most if not all of your teachers expected great things from you or more than you thought you could produce yourself. Does anybody acknowledge that? You say, yeah, they did kind of expect things that I wasn't always ready to deliver. Coaches do that. That's, that's why a coach is necessary. You could put a, a team on the field um, and just have them play, right? But a coach is a person that has seen and knows what human beings are capable of doing and they probably know better what you are capable of doing than you know yourself. You don't have any experience at first. And even once you have experience, it's very easy to fall back on your expectations. So up to this point, somebody else has been in charge of expecting things from you. Now there's two kinds of expectations. There's positive expectations, which you could put in the category of goals. You say, I'm going to shoot for this. I expect to achieve something, right? And there's negative expectations. Does anybody know a word that fits with negative expectations? Fail. Yeah, but excuses, right? Do we, does anybody here not have an excuse to perform poorly or to fail? They're pretty common. Excuses are like elbows. Everybody has at least two. I just need that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, um, on average, on average there you go. Oh, shoot. Maybe a little under two on average. But, um, maybe a little more than one. Not usually. An excuse is the single most powerful thing in human society, okay? If you have an excuse, it is so easy to wrap yourself around it or wrap it around you. And um, once you have a reason why you can fail and it not being your fault, how easy is that? Have you ever used an excuse to, to not? Do what you could have done? I have, right? And so on average, unless you're one of the top of the top of the top, uh, the average human being, when supplied with a really good excuse, is going to almost assuredly fail. And not fail like get an F, but fail to, fail to achieve what they could have achieved. So that's the two, the dichotomy that we're talking about here. Uh, positive goals and uh, negative excuses. And so I want to jump for a second to a psychological experiment I became familiar with in high school, I believe. It's called the Pygmalion effect. Has anybody ever heard of that? Do you know who Pygmalion was? Have you ever heard of the movie or the show uh, My Fair Lady? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, My Fair Lady was based on Pygmalion. Pygmalion was an earlier version. Um, and basically, it was all about expecting, I think Pygmalion was a statue that came to life. And uh, My Fair Lady was a, a lower class English girl who was then expected to achieve high lady status. But uh, it, in psychology, the Pygmalion effect was um, an experiment they did that they're not allowed to do this kind of experiment anymore, but uh, in a kindergarten class. So they, the researchers came in and they went to the kindergarten teachers and they said, we have tested your students. So this block of students in the school or schools and we have determined that the, the students on this list are very bright, and the students on this list are average, and the students on this list are a little slow. And they, for each class, for each kindergarten teacher, they supplied them with this information. And the, uh, the researchers then prompted them and instructed them, we want you to observe the students as they go through your classes, and we will come back after a period of some weeks and we want to know, they, they ostensibly wanted to know, how good the test was. How did it match what the students did? 
and perform, how they perform. And so they gave them the information, they went off, they let the teachers do what they do, and they came back. Now, I guarantee you, unless you're an unusual person, uh, the average kindergarten teacher is a good-hearted individual. Can we agree on that? They have to be. I mean, if you're going to deal with a class full of five-year-olds, um, that takes a special kind of person. So clearly, the teachers had no negative motivation here. They were just looking for the best things for their students. But astonishingly, what they found when the, the period of time was up, that this test was fantastic. I mean, it wasn't a 100% thing, but the students on the, the SMART list had been excellent, fantastic, outperformed the other students by a lot. The students on the average list were average, and the students on the slow list were slow. Now, you could say, well, that may just be because the, the teacher you know, thought that was what was going to happen. And to a certain extent, that's true. The expectations of the observer were important here. But also true, based on objective criteria, the students who were on the SMART list did outperform the other students. And the students on the average list performed about average among the students. And the students on the slow list underperformed the rest of their classmates. Now, here's the trick. There was no test. Those students were classified into these three categories at random. So you can easily explain the part that the expectations of the teacher um, were guided by what they were told, right? They knew what was supposed to happen, and that's what they saw. That happens all the time. That In science, that's something we, we constantly have to try to avoid. But um, the objective outperformance is even more remarkable because the ones that were supposed to be smart actually did better. So that's an interaction with the teacher. The teacher's expectations actually influenced how well they did. You get what I'm saying? So we had a double whammy here. In life, if expectations are such, for some reason, the, the people you're working with or going to school with or interacting with have high expectations of you because of how you dress, how you acted, how you presented yourself, then you're more likely to succeed, to accomplish these high goals that uh, are possible. And if you have fostered expectations among your audience that are negative, then you're less likely to succeed, even if you don't do anything different, consciously. There's nothing you choose to do. So this is an incredibly powerful thing. So now, again, let's come back to your situation. You're graduating from high school. You've had other people that, because they are, that's, that's just who they are and what they do. That's why they come to high schools. That's why they have families. They have high expectations for you. At this point, you're going to go off to college, a lot of you, or outside the home, whatever. You're going to go off and work and get married and do what you do. But uh, the proximity of those people who have high expectations of you is going to be less. They're going to be farther away from you. They're going to be less of a factor in your daily life. Now, that might be a little bit sad. It's also, that's, that's the way it is, right? That's good. That's the process of growing up. But the responsibility for carrying those high expectations for you going forward are now more on your shoulders, more than ever before, and it's going to be only increasing as you go along. So when you go out and create a first impression, you got to understand that has a real tangible effect on what's going to happen, on whether or not you're going to get an opportunity, and then how somebody is going to perceive your performance on that uh, is going to be based on what they expect you to do. You go into a teacher and say, yeah, I don't care about grades. What do you think is going to happen? Your grade is going to be less than it might be, possibly, on average, because the professor has, sometimes they have a hard choice. They have somebody who really works hard, and they've said, oh, I'm really interested in this. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to get an A. And then they see that person, and man, if they have to give them a B, it takes a little psychic pressure to do that, right? But if you said, I don't care what my grade is, there's no pressure. Ah, it's an 89. It's a B. No big deal. I'm not, this is not a 100% thing. But human beings being what they are, you want to put as much pressure on your side as possible. Right? You want them to expect you to do well. 
you want, if you're not doing well and they expected you to do well, they see something wrong, right? So they come up and say, hey, what's going on? How can I help you? I expected you to do well. You're not doing so well. But if you got somebody else who you didn't expect to do well, not doing well, that's normal, right? So if you're in your job and they think you're going to be awesome and something's not working out, that's a mismatch in their head. Something is in disorder. It's out of order. And so um, with a mismatch, they seek to make it fit what they think. And if it's not a mismatch, no big deal. So there's, there doesn't have to be any kind of nefarious plot against you. It's just, it's all going in the background. It's like programs running on your computer that you don't know about, right? This stuff is happening without any conscious thought at all. So I want to emphasize to you, it's incredibly important that you manage your own expectations, right? And that you manage the expectations of others. And that will be, until you are a doctor of some kind, you need to use good English, proper English, enunciate, present yourself well, well-groomed, well-dressed, polite, respectful, aggressive, creative, all of these things. You want to give the impression to others that you're the person that can get the job done. And whether it's a job or not, it doesn't matter in life, anything. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. So, now we've got, uh, we've got positive expectations for ourselves. We're creating positive expectations of ourselves from others. And I want to make sure you understand that the difference here is you're moving away from a time when you're managing, when other people are managing those expectations for you. And you're moving toward a time when you have to take over the burden of that yourself. And if you don't realize that's happening and you just kind of float along, you can be a passenger on this train, but you're never going to be driving it. Okay? The world is based on perception. And if someone perceives you to be um, mediocre, then that's pretty much what you're going to be unless you have an overriding perception yourself that that is not a fit, that that's a mismatch in your head. Okay? So, let me think here. The other thing, the flip side, the excuses, come back to that. Everybody has them. Every day, there's an excuse. There's always a reason why you might not succeed or you might not be able to. Oh, I'm too tired, I'm too busy, I'm sick, something happened, whatever. That's the human condition. Okay? We all have an excuse. Some people have more excuses piled on them than others. They may not have even chosen the excuses themselves. Somebody else has excuses for you. That's just as dangerous, if not more so. Okay? Whatever that temptation is, whatever that excuse is, you have to put that as far away from yourself as possible. I don't want to talk about that. You can't succeed. You're too short. Too tall. Not pretty enough. Whatever. Whatever the thing is, you've got to reject that and get it away from you. Don't even give it any time for processing, okay? Because if you do that, it is very much a danger. It's like a black hole. You get too close to that excuse and it will take you down. No excuses ever. There can be reasons things happen, there can be explanations for things, but you cannot adopt these to your heart and say, oh well, you know, my wrist hurt, I couldn't hit the ball that day, whatever it is. You with me? Okay, here's the last thing. And this fits in with the rest of this stuff. What I want you to do tonight, today, right now, whatever, I want you to get an index card, a three by five index card, and I want you to write down 10 things that you want to accomplish in your lifetime, okay? Now this is not a bucket list. This is not before you die. This is an affirmative, positive list. These are things I wish to accomplish in my lifetime. Now, the risk here, not risk exactly, but the common failing here is that you guys cannot dream big enough to make that list substantial, okay? You will put down there things that are almost sure to happen. You will put down there things that are uh, puny, things that are insignificant. I want to get a new Xbox 360. Is that the newest Xbox? What's the Xbox One? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we started over with the number. <laughs> I want to get the new Xbox One or the new whatever. I want to get a Camaro. I want to get a thing. 
okay, well, if it's a $2 million Maserati, then that might be a big enough dream that it's not gonna happen for a while. Most people, you guys aren't average, so I don't know what's gonna happen here, but most people, when they make this list of 10 items that they wish to accomplish in their lifetime, they've accomplished all of them within a year, okay? So let that be your guide. Do not write a list that, you've that you can accomplish in a year. But I seriously want you to do this. I want you to write this on a card, 10 things in your life that you wish to achieve. And then look at it once a year. These should be big things. So at this point, I need to take out my own card. Because this is my graduation speech that I've been waiting to give. That was a medium term goal. Four or five years I've been working on that. And the last thing I want to do is ask you if you had any expectations for this speech today. Did I create any expectations in your mind? <laughs> you see how powerful that is? Every person that saw me today thought I was going to play the banjo. All I did was bring in one, put it there, mention it a couple times. Right? I never said I was going to play it. And I'm not. I'm not good enough to play it in front of people. <laughs> but I want you to understand, expectations are incredibly power, powerful. In human interactions, in our daily lives, expectations are everything. So whatever it is about your life that you don't like, then you've got to get an expectation that says that is not okay. And seriously hold that in your head and your heart until it changes. As long as it's normal to you, it's going to stay that way. And if you have an excuse not to achieve whatever that goal is, you're never going to achieve it. So thank you very much.